Deke Slayton is a name which everyone interested in spaceflight has probably heard. One of the original seven Mercury astronauts, NASA's first chief of the astronaut office and director of flight crews. Plus, he flew on the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. Today, we talk about the legacy of Deke. And to do this, we have the honor of being joined by Deke's son, Kent Slayton, and the executive director of the Deke Slayton Memorial Museum, Elisa Young. Please share with us your favorite Deke Slayton stories. Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast if you are willing and able or press the share button. But right now, enjoy episode 102 of the Space and Things Podcast. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles and welcome to episode 102 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really, really well. Uh, yeah. I had a, had a good time this weekend, so that's all good. Awesome. Uh, I'm not trying to be rude, but we have quite a show for you today. So let's get to it. Absolutely. So Deke Slayton is someone we have spoken about many, many times. And you may remember episode 61 where I talked about his astronaut pin, which is an item I would want in my space museum if I had one. Well, as a result of that episode, we've ended up connecting with Alyssa Young, the executive director of the Deke Slayton Memorial Museum in Sparta, Wisconsin, which was Slayton's boyhood hometown. Deke's son Kent was trying to find out what happened to that precious pin and through Emily Space Hipster Group and this podcast, he was able to find out that it was in the Museum of Flight in Seattle. At that point, we thought we'd ask if they were both interested in coming onto the podcast to talk more about Deke. Uh, we couldn't think of any better guests to do this, so that's what we're about to do. Deke was one of the original seven astronauts and was originally scheduled to fly the fourth American space flight, which was called Delta Seven. However, he was grounded after NASA flight surgeons diagnosed him with idiopathic atrial fibrillation and the management eventually decided to ground him just two months before his flight. His fellow astronauts rallied around him and he was selected to be the chief of the astronaut office. He also took on the role of deputy flight crew operations. He was in charge of who flew and when and was the head of selection board for future astronauts as well. All the while he was doing these roles, he never gave up on his goal to go to space. And eventually, after many tests and different treatments, he was cleared for flight status in 1972 and flew in 1975 on the Apollo Soyuz test project, which was the first meeting and docking of a Soviet spacecraft and American spacecraft in space. After his flight, Deke managed the space shuttle approach and landing test. He officially retired from NASA in 1980, but continued to help out before formally leaving in 1982. When he left NASA, he became the president of Space Services, Inc., a Houston-based company founded to develop rockets for small commercial payloads. He also had a big interest in aviation racing, becoming the president of International Formula One Pylon Air Racing. He wrote two books, Deke, which was co-written with Michael Cassatt, and Moonshot, the inside story of America's race to the moon with fellow astronaut Alan Shepard and journalist Jay Barbary. Unfortunately, in 1992, Slayton was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumour and died at his home in Texas on June 13th, 1993, at the age of just 69. Okay, I know you're having a lot more fun up there than we are down here, so stay with it. Roger that. So welcome, Kent and Alyssa, and thank you both so much for joining us. So to begin with, we have a question for Kent. So tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Houston in the 1960s and the 1970s. So were you aware at that time that your father was such an important person within NASA? Dad was selected, I think it was the day after my second birthday. So I had no awareness of anything at that time, even including myself. So my my first memories are just NASA stuff. just hanging out you know all the astronauts were my dad's best friends Mm -hmm. you know obviously at that time i did not have an appreciation for anything because it was just what it was it was just life as usual 
except all these press people would show up and you didn't get to go outside and you're told don't talk to them and you know things like that but yeah you know it wasn't i think until i got older that i really had appreciation if dad i think had flown when he was supposed to i probably wouldn't have really appreciated that yeah but i was 18 when he flew on apollo soyuz so that that i was old enough then to really get it well as much as an 18 year old gets anything but and Alyssa, tell us a little bit about the museum and how it started was deke someone who visited sparta often and how big does his shadow loom over the town well i believe Deke did come back um, as often as he could um, back to Sparta. You know, he still had family here. There is still family here now, you know, but his brother was still on the family farm. So as far as I know, um, he came back um, as often as he could. Unfortunately, he passed away very young um, in 1993. Um, and they did have a, a service here in Sparta for him. Um, and part of his ashes are buried on the family farm. So he still did have a, a connection here. And just given everything that he did at NASA, um, we decided that we needed to celebrate that and um, really highlight where he was from, where he came from. Um, so 20 plus years later, we are still here. We have a lot of school groups that come through and we always make sure, one of the things I always make sure that they know is Deke was from Leon, which is part of the Sparta school, which is not, we're not very big. We just recently broke 10,000 uh, in population. So it's just, you know, carrying his legacy as, as much as we can and, and spreading his famous quote from Apollo Soyuz of decide what you want to do and never give up until you've done it, which he definitely lived. That's awesome. That's one of my favorite quotes. I have it printed out and I have it by a computer for bad days. Like you just remember that. So what part of Deke's time at NASA was he most proud of? And what do you think he, he should have been most proud of? Good question. I, you know, I, I think definitely the early days were the better days. I think as the space program grew and it got more bureaucratic and, you know, with the focus of beating the russians you know everything was streamlined everybody was fairly clear it happened quickly as the pressure came off after the moon landings and kind of moved into skylab and i think at that point more agencies got involved it got more bureaucratic probably got a little bit more frustrating for him at that time but uh yeah definitely the early years you know i mean they were magical you know you ask about what the early years are like and you know, I remember back at that time, and it was just, it was unprecedented. You know, we use that word a lot now, but it truly was. There was nothing like it. I mean, you know, the 60s were just absolutely insane with, with everything going on. So, you know, the space program was this one beautiful little pristine bit of goodness, I guess, that was happening at the world. Because, you know, NASA at that time had nothing to do with the military. We were, you know, trying to beat the Russians, but it was more of a proxy war. It was kind of more of, you know, who could beat who first in a leg race. I don't know what he was most proud of. Definitely the perseverance issue. You know, it was 13 to 16 years of basically watching everybody else fly. Mm. Um, you know, always being the, the supporter of everybody else's. So I think he was definitely proud of the fact, one, that, you know, he got to be, you know, the selector of the other astronauts. Um, you know, that was definitely an honor for him. And he took it in full stride. You know, it was funny. I wished I knew the actual answer to that because the problem with dad was he was a Norwegian farm boy. <laughs> and, and Alyssa probably understands. I do. I do. I'm, I'm part but, Norwegian, so I think I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> You don't talk about those things. Talk about very little things. It was maddening as a kid and as an adult. You know, dad would say these things. It's like, whoa, dad, what was that like? And he just looked at me like, what do you mean? I said, well, how did you feel? He didn't even know how to answer that question. Everything was just very scientific and matter of fact with him. So, you know, trying to get details and information was really hard. We just had um, Mark Lee here for a fundraiser dinner. He's an astronaut from Viroqua. He came on after your dad had retired, but one of the stories that he always tells when he comes, because he comes to our space camp too, because everyone will always ask him, How, did you meet Deke Slayton? And he would say, yes, the first time I met him, I 
went up to him and I said, hi, my name is Mark Lee. And your dad just said, yeah, I know who you are. <laughs> and that was it, which is pretty much par for how your dad was. <laughs> Don't need many words. But a few will suffice. Yeah. My dad was a very calm person. I don't remember him getting upset too often. He was just a very relaxed person. A lot of times we'd go hunting. He would never shoot anything. We'd just sit there and we'd look and we'd watch. And, you know, one of the things they mentioned at his service was, you know, how he and Gus would fly back and forth from coast to coast um, because they were trying to log hours, uh, flight hours. And apparently the two of them could literally fly from one side of the United States to the other, not say a word. Because they just didn't have anything to say. And that was dad. He just didn't have a whole lot to say. And when he did have a lot to say, he said it very briefly. When you were growing up and you said about his perseverance was probably the thing that we should have been most proud of. And and, and I agree. I think that story is really inspirational. And, and many will see that as a lesson of how not to quit, as, as Alyssa said about the, the quote from the Apollo Soyuz mission as well. So obviously he probably didn't talk about it, but were you aware at home of his efforts to at least try and get reinstated in flight status? Or was that just not spoken about? Or were you not aware? Were you too young to really appreciate the fact that he was making changes to try and make that happen? Yeah, no, it was, it was constant. You know, dad was a, he grew up in a generation of smokers. Everybody smoked. Uh, one of his stories was how he would take naps was he would light a cigarette and put it between his fingers and then he'd fall asleep. And then when the cigarette burned his fingers, that's when he was time to wake up and get back to work. The whole generation smoked. I mean, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember when you get on an airplane, the non-smoking light would go off and the whole place would just fill up with smoke. So he smoked cigars, he smoked pipes, he smoked cigarettes. And as soon as he was grounded, he quit, completely quit smoking everything overnight. Wow. He started taking massive amounts of vitamins. He ran every day. He had a thing called an exergenie. An exergenie was a resistance machine. It was like a tube with a rod down the middle, and you would twist it, and you would spiral the rope through this thing. So, you know, however many times you spiraled it, you know, you get a credible resistance, and then you'd wedge it into a door jam. And so dad would work out, you know, like he was working on weights, but it was resistance. So you'd pull this thing, and you just pull, and you'd pull, and you'd pull. And the whole house would shake, you know, he would be straining his muscles and I would wake up in the morning, you know, I could just hear the whole house vibrating, you know, from him doing this. And then, you know, he would sometimes run before he'd go to work, but he always ran after work. He was just extremely determined to kick this thing. I mean, some of the medical tests sounded awful. The things they did to him, you know, trying to recertify, trying to recertify, you know, he even went on under alias names trying to get medical exams. It was just brutal what they put him through, but I never heard him complain. You know, I remember mom, when they grounded him, they, they showed this in the Astronaut Wives Club movie or miniseries. She called Kennedy for weeks. She called the White House day after day after day after day. In the miniseries, they just showed her calling once and then hanging up and then going back and getting her hair done, which was not mom. No, it was relentless. And I remember that. And I just remember her crying. I just remember how upset she was because, you know, mom did not like to fly. Well, she liked to fly until I was born. And then one of those mom things happened to her. And after that, she could not fly, but she could always fly with dad. She was absolutely fearless with dad because she knew what he was made of and how good he was as a pilot. And she just thought it was ridiculous that we're in this space race and this heart thing that was very irregular. I mean, no pun intended. It was, it came and it went, it had no effect on his performance whatsoever. He could be in arrhythmia and pull more G's than anybody else. And it affected nothing, but it's political back then. And nobody really knew it was going to happen and everything was unknown. And so, you know, he understood that he did his job. He persevered. I don't think he really even expected to have a mission. And when, you know, Paulo Soyuz came up, there was an opportunity. And at that point, he just said, I have a chance. I'm going for it. But I think up till then, it was just like, you know, do the job, make it happen and do what you love. You know, I mean, that was the thing for him is that he loved to fly. He loved everything to do with flying. If he had never gotten to fly, I think he would have been, you know, loved every day of his job, you know, except for the meetings and the speeches. He hated speeches. Speaking of his speeches, we had a, a woman, she um, 
sent me an email first explaining how she um, went back in, I don't know, 75 or something at a young homemakers convention, how they had Deke Slayton was their speaker. And she apparently didn't really like what he had to say. So she somehow wrote a letter to NASA to say that, you know, this wasn't the best fit for this. And then your dad wrote a letter to her, um, which she saved and she has since donated to the museum. And we have it hanging in our um, in one of our cases. And it says in there, if you're not going to talk about flying, don't invite a test pilot to talk about anything <laughs> else. Um, and I can imagine they were sent everywhere, but I, I'm not sure what he would have brought to a homemaker's. <laughs> wow. I haven't heard that. Oh, it's a funny letter because, you know, your dad was very funny. Well, I think he's funny. Maybe it's the Norwegian dryness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just his one liners. They crack me up all the time. Um, even reading in his World War II journals, just some random off things. Oh, better not tell mom about the beers I've been drinking. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was something like that. I, I saw like his date book from like the late seventies, like his appointment book or something, and he would write notes in it. And one of the notes was something like "laugh my ass off at you know so and so today." Like somebody <laughs> told them a joke that was hysterical, and that was one of the notes in it. I was like, I wish I knew more about this incident, but because of his role at NASA, there have been so many actors who have played Deke in various films and television shows. The, the most recent one I can think of is is in the show For All Mankind. Deke actually shows up quite a bit in that. Do you allow yourself to watch those? And are there any which you think are actually good portrayals of Deke? You know, and have any of these production companies actually, you know, reached out to you for, you know, help or that maybe their approval? No, no, I've, uh, never heard from any of them yeah even even when they did um astronaut wives club the woman who played mom said well she had no living relatives so i didn't know who to talk to her about it well i'm alive and her sister is alive oh my god so what my my guess is that the people who write these want to have creative license to do what they want to do and they don't want to get into conflicts so it's more fun i guess to sometimes i don't know do your own thing than to stick with the facts. But, you know, that said, I, I, I think most of what I've seen, they've done a pretty decent job. I think it was Apollo 13. That was a little weird because they had dad in a suit the whole time. And all my memories of dad was he wear band lawn shirts. Almost every picture of him, he's wearing a band lawn shirt. So I don't know what the deal was with the suit because he just didn't do that. You know, I think they've done a, a pretty decent job. In my opinion, the reason he's so prominent in all of these things is because he kind of has to be, right? He was so important in real life. Do you feel that he gets the recognition he deserves from the wider public for his role in those early days? Or do you think like sometimes he's the forgotten man in, in some of these things because he didn't get one of those early flights? With joining Space Hipsters, the Facebook group, and then through that also joining other um, space enthusiast Facebook groups, I have really come to discover that he is still very, very widely respected. Prior to that, I didn't really, I didn't really know how the public saw him, but now my eyes have definitely been, been opened to, he is still a huge figure. There's still a lot of respect for him. And I often will tell Kent and, and Deke's brother, Dick, that you know he is still held in great esteem by a lot of people he has not been forgotten i work for a company that that's a ssi company a space services company deke was a president of that company during the 80s and early 90s and his legacy still really hangs over us in a head like in a big way and that's not a negative thing at all like you know, I, I write for our, the website for our company and I do a lot of content things. And every day I'm like, what would Deke say? You know, how do we do them right? So, yeah, it's definitely still like we want to honor this person's memory and do a great job, you know. And and with that being said, I also want to make sure that everything that we do at the museum is done with respect. And so I'll often check in with Kent and Dick because that is their family. And I want to make sure that what we're doing they 
approve of, for lack of a better term. Yeah, and we definitely appreciate that. Because like we were talking about earlier, you know, a lot of what people know is what they see on TV. And a lot of time that is just so inaccurate or it's spin. So, you know, I think it's important. And it's, it's amazing to me, you know, we live in this age of all this information, and yet somebody can get so very quickly misunderstood in a short period of time, history-wise. You know, Dave, I guess your question, I do feel like things have been preserved pretty well. And, you know, and I think part of it is because dad hung around so long. A lot of the other guys, they came and they went. Mm. You know, Al was around for a pretty long time, Alan Shepard. A lot of the guys, they came in, you know, they had their flights, they left. But dad kind of was this thread through the whole thing, almost from beginning to end. And and I think also, too, is, you know, like you guys were talking about, he was a very low-key guy. He didn't have a whole lot to say. He hated press. He hated the public eye. He just wanted to do his job. But, you know, I was just reading a quote from um, Alexei Leonov, and apparently he had to give these long speeches after or before launch. And uh, he kind of imitated dad and just said, you know, we're ready. And one of the other commanders said, you know, you sound like Deke. Because everybody else would be pontificating and he'd just say, we're ready. Let's go. <laughs> and that was it. And, and so it was interesting because he was such a low profile guy in a lot of ways, but yet he just managed to get things done. And, you know, and, and, and dad was amazingly well organized. That was, I didn't get that gene. I wish I'd gotten that gene, <laughs> but, you know, dad, dad could just kind of come up with an idea, make it happen. And most everything he did seemed to me pretty effortless. Um, I guess because he was organized, but he also was really good about going with the flow. And if things didn't go the way it was supposed to, it was kind of like, all right, well, we'll just wait. All right, Alyssa. So what are some of your museum's most prized artifacts? We have a piece of the moon nice. um, that uh, was awarded to Deke um, in 2006. Um, and since he was no longer with us, Bobby was the one who decided that the piece of the moon should be at his museum. Um, we also have one of his Mercury spacesuits on loan from NASA. And then almost everything that we have came from family, which nice. I think is incredible for how we're not mm. a very large museum, um, but we have a lot of stuff and almost all of it came from, from family. Yeah, I just found I've been talking to Alyssa about transferring a lot of stuff to the museum and I'm putting together a box and I found one of his old engineering textbooks with his uh, signature inside and a page of equations Nice that he had been working on. Wow. You know, that was right after he came out of the military. So, so yeah, still funneling things that way. Liz has done a wonderful job of taking care of it and probably have more stuff than there's wall space for it, but you know. <laughs> he got a lot of awards and a lot of plaques. Right, so is there an item which you wish you had be it his actual flight suit i mean obviously the one that he flew in was probably the would be the, the the main item right well i i have made a request to um the smithsonian museum um because they have deke's flown apollo soyuz spacesuit um so i have submitted a request um asking to have that on loan um you know to put right next to his mercury suit Fingers crossed that that will happen. And of course, we would absolutely love to have his his diamond pin. I don't think that's going to happen, but at least we know where it is and where, that it's safe and it's on display. I myself like those little personal things. Um, just recently, a gentleman, um, he was trying to auction off or sell um, from when, when Deke was in... Um, military and trying to get transfers and whatever forms they have to fill out. And I contacted him and I said, would you by chance like to donate that to the museum instead? And he said, absolutely. So we have, I like these personal touches, um, you know, things that are handwritten by him or things that he typed. Um, he was an excellent letter writer. Anyone who wrote letters to him he, he would always write back. And my understanding is he credits his mother <laughs> with, with that 
But I like those things. I love all those personal things as well. When I see those in museums, that's where I get excited because it feels like you get an insight to a personality that you don't normally get. Exactly. It's the real person. You get, yeah, you get to know the person, not the image. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite stories actually came from his brother, Dick, about um, a dog named Pookie. Have you ever heard this story, Kent? I have. I have. <laughs> yes. He saved this dog in Japan and uh, would fly with him. And then um, <laughs> as they were coming back home, somehow in Seattle, the dog got lost. But then a friend of his found the dog and shipped him back to the farm in Sparta. And Pookie lived on the Slayton farm until he was killed by a milk truck, as uh. most farm dogs are. But it's just a great, it's just a great heartwarming story that here's this stoic military man, but I'm going to save this mongrel dog <laughs> and he's going to fly in the cockpit with me. Dad loved dogs. He absolutely loved dogs. Yeah, it was, that was kind of, kind of the paradox of him is, you know, it's kind of, quiet and stoic as he was if you got him around dogs or children you know you just really saw another side of him you know all, all the dogs that we had growing up his dad was a hunter so if he had a dog it was a hunting dog it had to be some kind of a you know useful it had to be useful but you know when he married bobby they had these little uh, lasso apsos and all i remember is going bike riding with dad one day and he's got this little thing with a bow in its hair in the basket and we're riding along <laughs> and i just I was just thinking this is, this is, life is so much fun um and then then you know one of them get out and its name was bambo so here's dad running around the street screaming bambo bambo <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like why well, it's how beautiful how we all mature as we get older sue bean told me about how they had little small dogs and then your dad had little small dogs and how the two of them would get teased for being these big, strong astronauts with these little tiny frilly dogs. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I grew up with a Weimar honor and mom and dad bought him in Germany because the Weimar honor at that time was supposed to be the ultimate hunting dog. So, you know, it's supposed to be a pointer and a bird dog and a retriever and, everything and um i still remember this day this the, this dog his name was adonis von schwarzwald i mean he had a name <laughs> you know he was royalty in our family but he was a crazy dog and he did not like me you know, oh, no. you know as a kid i'd go and grab the ears and pull and then i you know i have blood running down my face and every friend i had he would attack you know i mean he was really a mean dog. Now, mom and dad said that was because he had been kept in a, you know, he had, we had a yard at Edwards and apparently the kids would come by and poke at him. So he got an attitude towards kids. But you no, know, I grew up with that dog and he and I kind of had an understanding. He wasn't a pet, you know, he was, he was Ace and Ace and I just kind of agreed to leave each other alone. So yeah, yeah, he ended up with lasso apsos. That was, <laughs> that was beautiful. That's hysterical. I, I watch a lot of like space services clips on like YouTube. I was watching this clip of like uh, one of the Starfire launches from White Sands Missile Range. He was the president, so he did, you know, he was speaking at the press conference. I'll never forget, like, they're like, and the company's president, Deke Slate, and everybody just starts clapping, like, woo! And I'm like, whoa! Like, you could tell people really loved him. That to me stood out. You know, you go to some events and you'll see like, and this is our CEO, blah, blah, blah. And people don't have that reaction. Of course, he had like aviator gla glasses and a leather jacket on. That probably didn't hurt. Yeah. Like, he looked <laughs> he looked cool, you know, so people were probably like, oh, this is the cool guy. You know, did he have the short shorts and the tube socks pulled up to his knees? No, that's a different <laughs> photo. That's for a uh, Conestoga one. That was oh. for their the launch from Matagorda Island and um I want to recreate this outfit for like a launch, but I'm afraid if I do, I'll get kicked out. So yeah, the tube socks with the shorts. Yeah. In the eighties, that was cool. It's really interesting though, isn't it? Because uh, I always think of whenever you see the images of him in mission control, lurking around mission control, he always seemed to be the suavest and, and the best dressed. So uh, yeah, short shorts, that one, obviously he probably should have uh, avoided, but you yeah. know, 
It was hot. It was Texas. I, yeah, I think. It, yeah. Maybe there we go. There we go. Practical. Dad was always practical. <laughs> and mom did have to dress him. I remember that. <laughs> Because, you know, the 60s and the 70s were probably America's low point in fashion. So, you know, you had all kinds of crazy things happening and spots and stripes and dad would dress in whatever. And she'd have to say, no, 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 send him back. <laughs> you can't do stripes and <laughs> spots. He has a tie from that era that I'm obsessed with. And he's in like several NASA press conferences just wearing this loud polka dotted, like wide 70s tie. I was about to say, yeah, that was a. Yeah, I've seen some pictures of the seven reunion guys, and they're all with their <laughs> yeah. polyester wide lapels <laughs> and the colors. And it's like, wow, wow, that's just, that hurts to watch. You know, cause, <laughs> sorry, what the backgrounds they all came from. Deke Slate and King of Fashion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. With that in mind, let's finish off by uh, what What do we think is his enduring legacy? Was it the king of fashion or <laughs> do we have uh, other things we'd like him to be remembered for? Oh, goodness. You know, what you're saying earlier, I, I was just thinking is interesting. A lot of people who know me might know me for years before they ever know who dad was. And then when they find out he was, you know, say, oh, did he go to the moon? You know, and it's kind of like, you know, if, if you're an astronaut and you didn't go to the moon, you didn't rate. Hmm. You know, and then when you consider just the small handful of people actually, you know, went to space and went on the moon. But, you know, I think what was interesting was the fact that because he was there and he was so instrumental in being a part of all the little steps all along the way. You know, and I, I think that's his legacy is just that he was kind of like a, a thread that ran through the whole thing. And he could have easily have gotten lost, but he didn't. And it wasn't because I think he wanted to be anybody. Um, maybe that's because he didn't want to be anybody. You know, he, you're talking about, you know, being in crowds and talks and stuff. And usually after a talk, dad would spend a whole lot of time in a corner with the oldest person in the room talking to them or playing with a kid because that was just kind of who he was. And I think it was that personality, just that very real, very just real guy. Um, that endeared people to him. And the fact, maybe that was the juxtaposition was that he, he had this position, but yet in reality, it was just about just being your best self. And that's always his message. You know, he told me the same thing. I guess a lot of dads say, you know, said, you're going to be a garbage man, be the best garbage man in the world. He said, I don't care what you do. I want you to be the absolute best. And he did what he loved. And I think that's the message is don't, don't be who other people want you to be or who you think you should be. You know, I, I do believe as a therapist, we all have kind of an inner calling. We all have this vibe. And when we find that vibe, nothing can take you away from it. Once you find it, you're on it. And he was lucky to have born at the right place at the right time. Just all the stars lined up, you know, for him in a lot of ways. And he knew that. He absolutely understood that if he had been maybe born in another place or a year later, or a year earlier, none of that would have happened. So he had a great appreciation for just humility, I guess. And we normally do this bit after the guests have disappeared, but I'm doing this now because I think it's it's a fun thing to do with, while we're all together. Uh, in my opinion, he was the most important guy there. Uh, I've always thought that. he's As you said, because he's that thread, he was the connection between everything. Everything went through him. And, and you take him out of that equation and it may not have worked. And there's a reason why... In my opinion, that pin that he had that was different to all the other guys is so wonderful because he wouldn't necessarily have wanted to be singled out as being the most important from what I understand of him, but he was the most important. And that pin kind of epitomizes that role that he had within the organization. That's just my view from having read everything and and, and watched every documentary go in and, and try to piece this all together. If you take him out of the equation, it may not have worked. Yeah. I was just, you know, thinking what made the pin special is it didn't come from a president. No. It didn't come from NASA. You know, it came from the wives. Yeah. And it came from the widows of, you know, the Apollo 1 fire. And, you know, to this day, you know, dad never talked about it. I have no idea how he felt. Bobby told me she'd found a tape with him talking about it and that she burned it. And she said, nobody will ever know what was on that tape. And so I have no idea kind of what the feelings were, but I knew that they gave him that was probably 
you know, again, it wasn't the big stuff. It was the people. It was just the day-to-day -day people that were important to him. And that's another evidence of, of the humility that uh, that he had. He was he was just a person like everybody else, and he just did his job the best that he could. I was talking to Ed Gibson, as one does, you know, the astronaut. <laughs> I was talking to Ed Ed Gibson, and he mentioned, and I'll, I I remember this quite vividly. He was saying, "Yeah, we had the best boss there was," and he was talking about Deke. You know, and he was a scientist. And when he joined NASA, astronaut scientists weren't being viewed as like a lot of people didn't like that development, you know, so you would have thought people like Deke would have it would have been like oil and water, but not at all. Like Ed had so much respect for him and he loved working for him. So to me, that that said everything, you know, even though they were kind of from different environments, he worked hard to make everything just vibe together. May I ask a question? Of course. Mm -hmm. So Kent. As Deke's Slayton son, what are you most proud of? For example, I, I think about my dad and the thing that I love and appreciate the most is that he is, my, my dad is kind. He is very kind and he will help whoever needs helping. And when other people recognize that in him, it I just swell with pride that they, that they see that too. I was just curious what you're most proud of with your dad and you don't have to answer if you don't want to yeah no i'm I'm just you know there's a lot of ground to cover there um there were there really really is so, <laughs> <laughs> you know i i think it would probably be his tolerance i never heard my dad say a critical word towards anybody well there was two people he was frustrated with they said profoundly stupid things um and as a scientist, he thought that was just annoying. But I never heard him snark. I never heard him criticize. I never heard a racist anything come out of that man's mouth. I remember we were in Russia the last time we were in Russia. And always when you get together with the Russians, there's toasting. And the toasting is usually about to the Americans who helped us fight the Germans because they're still pretty sore about that. <laughs> and so there'd always be that toast. And I remember once the night was wearing on, I guess the toasts were kind of running out and somebody made some comment, and I'm, I'm gonna horribly misquote this, but it was something about, you know, to, to fighting the people in the Middle East. And everybody started to raise their glasses and dad stopped them. And he said something and everybody got really quiet. He said, you know, there's more, one, there's more of them than us. And two, we know nothing about them. We don't know where they've been. And until we understand them, we can't judge them. And there was just not a word. It was just dead silence. And somebody made a joke and they all laughed and they toasted. But, you know, I think what I appreciate was just that dad was just a very non judgmental, very open, loving guy. And maybe that's what made him good at his job is that he didn't go in with agendas. He didn't go in with, as they say, positionalities on things. Because when you know, one thing I know as a therapist is when you have a position on something, you stop seeing the other options. You know, once you go in knowing what you don't know, that's when you see the answers. That's when you're open to the information you need to be listening to. And then if I may also ask, what were you most proud of with your mom? The, the wives of astronauts, I think, had, had a very hard life. A lot of people loved your mom. Um, but they don't know the, her as a mom. So I'm sure you have to be proud of her. What What were you proud of your mom for? Mom was amazing. I, I'm so frustrated with how they portrayed her in the movie because the opening scene, and it happens real fast, so it's hard to catch. But she had told me this story where she was a secretary for a general in Japan. And she got wakened up in the middle of the night and they said, MacArthur is here. He needs you to dictate a letter. And so she's running down the street in her robe and slippers. And she's typing this letter in front of her boss with MacArthur dictating to her. And she typed this letter flawlessly, didn't make any mistakes. She was scared witless. And almost nobody ever knew that story. And she told me about it. And when I told some of the other wives, they said, I never knew that. And mom didn't tell me that in a you know, I typed a letter from MacArthur kind of a way, which is how it came out, you know, in the show. It came out as I was so scared 
I was so <laughs> frightened and I thought I was just going to type crazy letters because I was shaking so bad. And she said, but I did it. I actually did it. And I think she told me that at a time where I was struggling, you know, with being, you know, anxious and a teenager. And, you know, she said, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be nervous. Just do your best, which again, kind of echoed dad's messages. But, but she also knew no strangers. We would go to a restaurant and she'd say, I went to this cafe yesterday and it's a really great place to have breakfast. Let's go. So we'd go and we sit down. The waiter would come. She'd go, hey, John, how's Susie doing? And he's, oh, well, you know, she's doing better. The doctor says, you know, and it's, oh, great. You know, and I say, I thought you were only here once. And she goes, yeah. I say, like, you know his name and you know about his children? She goes, yeah. And that was mom. <laughs> if you met her, she would know everything about you, whether you wanted her to or not. <laughs> You're the perfect combination of your parents. <laughs> she was the FBI. That's hysterical. Well, you know, she actually um, got hired by the CIA. <laughs> she applied with the CIA, and it took so long that she took on the position in um, Japan. And then they called her and said, well, we have a job for you, but she was already hired at that point. Amazing. Yeah. So I think that's what made it natural for her to be sort of the female complement to dad. So, you know, while he was taking care of the guys and making sure they were okay, you know, she'd been a military wife. She understood how hard it was. And so she just naturally kind of gathered everybody up under her wings and kind of just, just spontaneously started having luncheons, you know, just get them together. And it was just like, you know, they just sit and just talk. So I think that was, you know, that was just completely organic for the both of them. This has been so amazing. I kind of don't want to stop, but I, we kind of have to. Thank you both so much for this insight. I felt like we were going to talk about the legacy of Deke, which we have. But I feel also what we've done is we found out about the real Deke Slayton. Uh, and, and I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we've been able to do. My heart's full right now of we're hearing these stories and, and finding out more about this person, which I've looked up to for so long. And I hope our listeners also get that vibe as well when they, when they hear this as well. So thank you very much, both of you. And I just you know want to formally thank you guys for tracking down Anna Lisa, all of y'all for tracking down the pen. Oh boy, it was I'm just... going to start crying now. <laughs> oh boy. It's been kind of a story that I've been fascinated with for ages just because I know what that, oh God, I'm tearing up. I apologize. I just know what that meant to him. I was very happy to, to give you answers, Kent. That was, that was my biggest goal was for you. And I'm really glad that we were able to do that. Well, and I'm just so grateful because, you know, and I've, I've told Alyssa this, you know, that that I just kind of had to let a lot of stuff go when I saw what was going up for auction and wasn't going to family. It just I I just had to just walk away. It was just really killing me. So a lot of it, I just sort of moved on with my life and said, whatever. But I've always thought about that pin and I've often wondered what happened to it. And all of a sudden there's this email and it says, I found the pin. It's like, oh, my goodness. And I thought it was sitting in somebody's safe somewhere or somebody's anonymous collection so uh, thank you for all of you very very much dad would be just thrilled oh yes. boy thank you well i saw the pin in 2019 when i went to the museum of flight as part of the apollo 11 50th anniversary because at the time that's where the apollo 11 command module was so i went to go and see that thinking that was going to be the highlight they also had uh, Buzz's EVA helmet from his moonwalk and the, the famous pen which went up for auction last week that didn't sell uh, that he saved the mission Buzz saved the mission with but the highlight of that day was seeing that pin uh, and the display they had for it was amazing it's in good hands yes. I mean that museum is a good museum it may not be your hands I'd rather it be there but it's in good hands it is um, they they sent me the museum of flight in Seattle they sent me pictures of their um, Deke Slayton exhibit and the different um, things that they have, and then where they also have the pin. And of course, I did ask if they would loan it to <laughs> us, and they said probably not because it is actually in the, an exhibit, and it would look kind of funny to have this blank <laughs> hole right there. But it is in good hands. It is on display, and so I'm just very excited that uh, that we know where it is, and that Kent knows where it is, and Dick knows where it is. 
Yeah, this museum is really cool, by the way. If anyone's listening, go and visit. If you're interested in flight, it's amazing. It's got Boeing's original Red Barn. It's got loads of amazing, amazing aircraft. It's got one of the original space shuttle simulators, the big thing that used to be in Houston. It's really cool. And what's good about that is that it gets visited a hell of a lot. And that means a lot of people are going to see the pin and find out about Deke. And that is what we really want, right? Absolutely. Well, and on behalf of Deke and Marge, I just want to say thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you oh very much. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. You are listening to Space and Things. Wow. Uh, I'm really trying not to cry right now. Um, <laughs> that was very moving and incredible. Um, I just thought that was the most wonderful interview. Kent, I could listen to him talk all day. He has a, a calmness himself. Uh, that just was really comforting. And I loved how it, hearing him talk. Yes. And I loved how Alyssa took over and asked questions that we should have thought of to ask. It was amazing. I love it when someone comes on and takes over, but in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. You can absolutely see why she's the perfect person to have a job as an executive director of a museum. Yeah. Because she wants to get to the bottom of things and she wants to find the right stories. And she asked the questions, as I said, that we should have asked. But they made our interview so much better. And I'm really grateful that she was on this interview with us. And I hope that it makes people want to go and check out that museum. I'm planning on going there myself in December. So uh, I hope other people go and check it out. There'll be a link in the show notes to their website. So if you're ever in Sparta in Wisconsin or passing nearby, do a little detour. Why not? But the thing I love about this interview is they always say, don't meet your heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously we can't meet Deke, but this is as close as, uh, as we can get meeting a family member who knows him better than anyone. And I feel like we have got to know him. And actually, I, I now wish I had met him. I don't think I would have been disappointed to have met the real Deke Slayton if he was anything like what we've heard today yeah. and I really hope that he was because that was a wonderful it, interview. Absolutely. I, I don't really have much more to add to that. I mean, it was just, we got a better picture of somebody who we already looked up to and, and we just admire him more, you know? Absolutely. So if you want to watch that full interview and I, you should go and watch this interview, then, then please head over to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. Endeavor Houston, we see a nominal Miko, Ohms 1, not required. Welcome to space. So, it's been a busy launch week. In fact, it was a busy launch day. On Thursday the 4th of August, there were five or six, depending on what time zone you were in, launches on the same day. So, there were two launches in one day at Kennedy Space Center, which doesn't happen often. There was two in China, one in New Zealand, and one in West Texas which was a crewed suborbital flight for Blue Origin, taking six new people into space briefly. Fortunately, on Sunday the 7th of August, there was a failed launch attempt in India. This was the first attempt of the small satellite launch vehicle, which did make it into space, but had an unstable orbit, which would have caused the satellites it was deploying to re-enter the atmosphere far too quickly. As always, full details of these launches, their payloads, and any videos which may exist can be found in our show notes, which you can find on spaceandthingspodcast.com. It's full speed ahead for the Artemis 1 launch, which is currently scheduled for August 29th. It will start its rollout on August 18th, and it appears that Florida will be very busy with the NASA website crashing with so many people attempting to buy tickets to watch the launch when they were released last week. I was one of the people on the website, and yeah, I didn't get in on time, so... Ah, uh, no. Yes! Oh, well. Uh, also, the current head of the astronaut office, uh, Reed Weissman, has announced that we'll know the crew for the Artemis II flight later this year and that all 42 of NASA's current active astronauts are up for selection, not just the 18 Artemis astronauts that were announced in 2020. This second mission will launch no earlier than 2024. Yeah, that's an interesting development that they've done that, that... Because they made such a big deal out of those 18 Artemis astronauts, didn't they? Yeah, they had a, they had a poster. A big, yeah, big press launch and everything. And we, we did a whole podcast on it. Yeah. One of our earliest podcasts. So, uh, yeah, that's an interesting development. Yeah, this show supersedes that one. I have no idea how that works. That is weird. I, I thought the same thing. Yeah. So, startup rocket company Astra has decided to stop production of its current rocket line following the launch failures they've had in their first few attempted missions. 
However, they have said that they will be focusing their attention on a more powerful vehicle, which will have a higher reliability, capacity, and rate of production. All three of those things make it sound like a really good business option to me. So that may be the end of Rocket 3, but we'll keep our fingers crossed that Rocket 4 will be able to deliver on all those extra things. Elsewhere, Virgin Galactic have pushed their first commercial passenger flight back three weeks into spring 2023. This is due to upgrade delays for the company's mothership, Eve, the modified Boeing 747, which is used to carry the spacecraft up to 50,000 feet before releasing it. These delays apparently are caused by pandemic-related supply chain issues, so happening a lot of places. Yeah, and following the Inspiration4 mission last year, you may remember that we reported that billionaire Jared Isaacman has funded a three-mission Polaris program. And the first mission of that program, Polaris Dawn, will hopefully launch in December on a SpaceX Dragon capsule and will hopefully include the first spacewalk of a private astronaut. That spacewalk will also be the first spacewalk from a Dragon capsule and will use a brand new SpaceX-developed EVA suit. It will be the first time a, a, a capsule has been used in this way since Gemini Apollo days where they had to depressurize the whole capsule for the spacewalk, which, which is, is nuts. really interesting. The mission will once again attempt to raise money for the St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Isaacman will again be commanding the mission, but this time he includes his friend Scott Petit alongside two SpaceX employees who helped massively with the Inspiration4 mission, Anna Menon and Sarah Gillers. And finally, while we're talking about private spaceflight, NASA has announced that any private missions to the International Space Station must have an experienced former agency astronaut commanding the mission, Building off the experience of Axiom Space's first mission to the ISS in April, which was commanded by Michael Lopez Alegria. The debriefs from that first mission have concluded that the main crew aboard the ISS had to spend a lot of time helping the tourists do basic things and completing their work even with Lopez Alegria on board. So this seems like a sound idea and hopefully they'll also spend even more time training any potential tourists heading to the ISS. Yeah, you don't really want the crew that are up there having to do too much for these tourists, do you? You don't want them distracted from the work that they're doing. It's really quite critical yeah. up there. Uh, workflow issues, yeah, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we all know what that could lead to. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> LM Houston, your feet wet. Right, your feet wet. That's it for this week. Next week, we've got something special for you in relation to the Artemis 1 launch that's coming up. A big thank you to all of you who commented on our last episode and shared it with your friends. We hope that any new people here stick around and maybe you'll have a look through our archive on our website to see if there's any old episodes which tickle your fancy. Is that an English expression? I don't know. We use it here too. Oh, okay. Good, 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 we, good. We do use it here. So yeah. <laughs> I was nervous that suddenly I was saying something that you would be like, what the hell are you on about? Tickle yeah, Americans my fancy. Are gonna, yeah. No, <laughs> we use it here. I, I've heard of it before. So yeah, there's some meme out there I saw and I almost sent it to you, but I didn't want you to block Is me. this the metric system one? No, not that oh, one. Right. It was one about like what English people call foods. And oh, I'm like, here we go. I, and I and I did not want to send it to you because I was like, he's just going to block me. He's going to be like, this is insulting. This is insulting. Never. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. No, no, especially not if you don't send them to me. Oh, that's true. That's true. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.